In late September, it began to rain and mud started to become a problem for us. Wind whipped the rain into our faces and soaked our uniforms as we marched. Snow came in early October, but it was not cold enough for the ground to freeze and everything turned to mud. By October 8th, the earth was simply a quagmire of mud. Great clumps of mud clung to our boots and every step produced a smacking suction noise. It played havoc with the horses. We were also unprepared for the snow because we had not received winter clothing. Kroeger asked his company commanders and me to meet with him in his tent shortly after we reached Vyazma. This was a rare occurrence, so we knew it was important. When the four of us had seated ourselves on the folding camp stools, we learned what was on his mind. Gentlemen, from now on our division will be a frontline unit, he said. The panzer divisions are being pulled out for other deployments. He paused and we looked at each other uneasily. From here on until we reach Moscow, it is just infantry and artillery. Until now the panzers have had all the glory in this campaign. Let's show them what infantry and artillery can do without them. From Vyazma on, the 87th Infantry Division was never out of combat, and it was infantry and artillery only, fighting as a broad front toward Moscow. My battery marched, as always, with the infantry battalion we supported, we would occupy one village and the Russians would be in the next village. During the night, the infantry would send out patrols to try to find out where the least resistance was. In the morning, my battery would open fire on targets in the next village, which would be seven or eight kilometers away. Then our infantry battalion would move forward. In most cases, we would take that village and the next one and stay overnight there before repeating it all again the next day depending on how difficult the terrain was and how much resistance we encountered. The sound of combat was deafening. It was like combining every loud noise anyone ever heard into one colossal deafening roar. It was a virtual hurricane of noise, but it did not pass by as a hurricane does. It remained as long as the fighting went on. The roar of combat was the combined sounds of heavy artillery, light artillery, mortars, machine guns, hand grenades, rifles, every weapon used on the battlefield. The roar of combat alone was enough to shatter a soldier's will. But combat was a great deal more than just noise. It was a whirlwind of iron and lead that howled about the soldier, slicing through anything it hit. Even inside the roar of battle, strangely, the soldier could detect the whistle of bullets and the hum of slivers of shrapnel, perceiving everything separately. A shell burst here the rattle of machine gun fire over there, an enemy soldier hiding behind cover in another place. In spite of the confusion swirling around the soldier in combat, he still retained a clear sense of his own strength and the strength of the men beside him. He felt an almost palpable sense of solidarity with his fellow soldiers. This was the brotherhood of the combat soldier. Improbable as life in combat was, after a while it became the only reality and the combat soldier soon found it difficult to remember anything else. He would try to remember the face of a loved one, and he could not. The soldier on his left and on his right became the only reality, and now, in truth, the only loved ones. To the combat soldier, life became an endless series of hard physical work, raw courage, occasional laughter, and a terrible sense of living out a merciless fate that would inevitably culminate in his death or mangling. It was a hard fate for young men. Strangely, the more stalwart and robust-looking men were more likely to lose their nerve in combat than the supposedly weak ones. By late October, the mud was so bad that nothing could move in it. All movement stopped, except on railroads and paved roads, which gave the Russians time to build up their forces behind the line. Even infantry on foot could move only with the greatest of difficulty. Nothing on wheels or tracks could move at all except on the post road or railroads. The only way we could move vehicles was to corduroy the roads with small tree trunks laid side by side to provide a solid surface. We established corduroy roads between our gun positions and our source of ammunition and supplies at division headquarters. Such roads were difficult footing for the horses and the vehicles jolted over them, but at least we could transport supplies and ammunition. A hard freeze came on November 7th, which proved both an advantage and a disadvantage. We could move again, but now we were freezing because we still did not have winter clothing. We had the same field uniforms we had worn during the summer, plus a light overcoat. It seemed inexplicable that they could not get winter clothing to us. The quartermaster people were doing a good job of getting everything else to us, but no winter uniforms. 
We tried to spend the nights in villages so we could get out of the weather. In November this far north, we had only seven hours of daylight. We would start well before daylight and keep going long after dark because of the short hours of daylight. As long as we marched, of course, our physical movement kept us from freezing. The Russians had a real advantage over us because they had warm felt boots and quilted uniforms, and we had only our thin overcoats which did not offer much protection from the cold. The only reason we were ever given for not receiving winter clothing was that we were moving too fast. The reasons given for failure always sound plausible. Some of our soldiers took felt boots from dead Russian soldiers. But we did not dare risk wearing their heavier quilted jackets for fear of being shot for a Russian. Fortunately, we could pull the flaps of our field caps down to keep our ears from freezing. The men wrapped their blankets about themselves over their overcoats and caps and cursed those responsible for not providing us with winter clothing. The snow blew almost horizontally in blizzards that sometimes lasted all day long with the wind piercing our faces with a thousand needles, the cold numbed and deadened the human body from the feet up until the whole body was an aching mass of misery. To keep warm, we had to wear every piece of clothing we owned to achieve a layered effect. Each man fought the cold alone, pitting his determination and will against the bitter winter. We reduced sentry duty to one hour, then to 30 minutes, and finally to 15 minutes. The cold was, quite simply, a killer. We were all in danger of freezing to death. The Russian resistance became more and more determined now as we neared Moscow, and our casualties were becoming much heavier. At first, we had had fairly light casualties, and we had taken a seemingly endless stream of prisoners, but now our progress was slowing considerably, resistance was stiffening, prisoners were fewer, and our casualties were higher. Stalin, who understood the Russians' great love of their country, had declared this war to be the great patriotic war and convinced his people that it was not communism they were fighting for, but Mother Russia. It worked for him. By December, we were no more than 25 kilometers from Moscow, but the temperature was paralyzing. Heavy snow fell on December 1st, and the pitiless cold became unbearable. Our world had become a huge frozen abyss in which the white snow glittered in the flashes of our gunfire and turned pink or green in the light of signal flares. Mortars were of little value because the explosion was muffled in the deep snow. Although we were freezing, we still provided enough warmth for the lice that fed on us. We had become, quite simply, frozen and exhausted men who were being constantly tormented by vermin. We felt like livestock rather than human beings. The snow seemed to fill the air with a soft mist, bringing the earth and sky together into one meaningless blur. It drifted about over the level ground, swirling and forming strange and surrealistic patterns. Frostbite was beginning to account for many casualties, sending men home with amputated toes or fingers. I had not worn clean clothes for two weeks. I tried to imagine what it would be like to stand under a hot shower and scrub my back with a stiff, bristled brush. The image was maddening and I quickly ejected it from my mind. On December 4th, we were in a village just outside Moscow. We had established a defensive line around the village the evening before. In the early hours of a freezing, disagreeable morning, just as my battery was about to lay down a barrage on the next village, we saw a group of 30 to 40 Russian soldiers moving toward us across open ground. Our infantry opened fire on them with mortar and machine guns and drove them back. A while later, they attacked again, this time in company strength of 150 or so men. Again, the infantry drove them back. Then they attacked in battalion strength with about 500 men. We could see them moving out about three kilometers away. I got my guns ready and opened fire on them, but they kept coming. It was just suicide because they were out in the open and they had no tanks or artillery or protection of any kind. They got as close as 200 meters before they were totally decimated. Because I could not believe they would behave so irrationally, I went out to learn anything that might shed some light on their reason for such suicidal behavior. Hundreds of dead and wounded lay in the reddened snow, horribly mangled and splattered with blood, their eyes growing dim as their lives ran out. Our medics moved among them, tending to those who were still alive. They all appear Mongolian, a voice said behind me. It was Kroeger. He was also apparently looking for clues. All the Russians I have seen until now have been Caucasian. You are right, I agreed. 
What do you suppose that means? And why in God's name would they waste infantry against artillery? That is worse than stupid. It is criminal to waste lives that way. If they had waited until night, they would have had a better chance. But they did not stand a chance in daylight when we could use artillery against them. Maybe they thought we were so weakened by the cold that they could just walk in and take us because they had fresh troops, Kroger speculated. As we approached the outermost suburbs of Moscow, a paralyzing blast of cold hit us, and the temperature dropped far below zero and stayed there. Our trucks and vehicles would not start, and our horses started to die from the cold in large numbers for the first time. They would just die in the bitter cold darkness of the night, and we would find them dead the next morning. The Russians knew how to cope with this weather, but we did not. Their vehicles were built and conditioned for this kind of weather, but ours were not. We all now numbly wrapped ourselves in our blankets. Everyone felt brutalized and defeated by the cold. The sun would rise late in the morning as harsh now in the winter winds as in the heat of August, and not one fresh footprint would be visible for as far as the human eye could see. Frostbite was taking a very heavy toll now as more and more men were sent back to the field hospitals with frozen fingers and toes. Many infantry companies were down to platoon size. On December 5th, the temperature plummeted to 30 degrees below zero. It was almost impossible for the human body to function in such numbing cold. Our feet felt like awkward blocks of ice as we struggled to put one foot in front of the other and keep walking. I found myself wondering if anything could possibly be worth such suffering. The flesh on our faces and ears would freeze if we left it exposed for very long and we tried to wrap anything around our heads to prevent frostbite. I could not help thinking of Napoleon's army retreating from Moscow. Our fingers froze even in gloves and stuffed into our overcoat pockets. They were so stiff from the cold that they refused to perform any function. We could not have fired our rifles. I could not help wondering if our superiors in Berlin had any idea of what they had sent us into. Such thoughts constituted defeatism, I knew, but that threat seemed of little consequence at the moment. Instead of moving on immediately after reaching the next village as we normally would have, some of us went into a peasant hut to get warm because the cold was surely going to kill us if we did not. Oberlieutenant Schumann, battery commander of 3rd Battery, and I, along with our forward observation officers and an infantry lieutenant, went into the same hut to try to warm up. We should not have congregated the key officers from two artillery batteries in the same spot where we could all have been killed en masse. But the cold was beyond human endurance, and we had to get warm if we were to survive. We were sitting on the stone stove in the middle of the hut, just beginning to thaw out, when we heard the sharp cracks of tank cannons. We had received no warning from our infantry, and we had just got up to investigate when a tank shell crashed through a corner of the hut and exploded. Shrapnel blasted through the room, scattering broken and bleeding bodies, filling the room with smoke, the smell of burned powder, and the astonished cries of wounded soldiers. Two people were killed instantly. Although he was alive, Schumann's face was covered with blood from a head wound that was obviously very serious, and blood was coming from his arm and neck as well. The blast had knocked me down, and when I tried to get up, I fell again. I realized that I had a head wound also and had lost my sense of balance. Seeing blood on my sleeve, I inspected my arm and discovered that a chunk of flesh about the size of a large coin was missing from the fleshy part of my upper left arm. Further inspection revealed a piece of shrapnel sticking in the metal insignia of my collar, which had obviously spared me a very nasty neck wound. Everyone in the room was dead or wounded. I called for a medic to come and tend to Schumann. Schumann could speak but he was very seriously wounded. He was a big man, six foot five and well over 200 pounds. Perhaps he had just been too big a target. The medics applied rough bandages to our wounds. Eight or 10 Russian tanks had been able to slip past our weary infantry unnoticed. We had not seen Russian tanks for some time and were probably not as alert as we should have been. They had found an area of depression in the terrain that they could slip through undetected. Letting them catch us unawares was a poor performance on our part. If we had not all been so concerned about getting in out of the cold, it would not have happened. Their tanks did not have infantry with them, however, so they just came close enough to the village to shoot into the houses and then withdrew. 
because tanks without infantry were very vulnerable. The first time I had been wounded in France, I had been surprised, but when it happened the second time, I just thought, okay, it has happened again and I am still alive, so I am lucky, and I hope I am just as lucky next time.